2005, as I often am, I was running late. And I was on the way to Newark Airport to go to O'Hare. And I know how to get to Newark. I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> and I was pretty flustered, and I got lost. And I really didn't want to miss this flight, because I was on my way to see my fiance, who was spending the last month, well, we did not know, but it was in fact going to be the last month of her 13-month prison term. So I really didn't want to miss this flight. <laughs> but I made the flight. And when I got to Chicago, I was greeted by the it was a very cold, dark February night. I was greeted by the very warm arms of my good friends Gabrielle and Ed. And Gabrielle and Ed were real lifesavers. Uh, Piper was indicted in 1998 in a, in a Chicago federal court. So between 1998 and 2005, we spent a lot of time going back and forth between New York and Chicago, a lot of rigmarole, or as Larry Bloom might say, Michigas. <laughs> <laughs> and to have friends in Chicago to, to greet you and to house you and to hold you was so important. And when I landed, they said, you know, your regular, your regular dish from the Thai food you like is here. <laughs> and uh, we've got a bourbon on the rocks because if you're going to visit your girl in the clink, the only drink is a bourbon on the rocks. <laughs> and the next morning, I went to a new prison for, for all of us, in fact. I went downtown to Chicago, uh, and I looked at this uh, really, in, uh, even for prison, a pretty intimidating 26-story windowless concrete monolith where my fiance was now housed and she'd been there for almost a month for reasons that are insane but so much of the prison system is insane that you sort of got to read the book to find out <laughs> and when i got there i said i i'm i'm here to see Piper Kerman. here's my id i'm on the list and they said um uh we, we don't see your name what do you mean? Um, I checked. I, I, I checked. They said, I've been, I've, I've been to see Piper and Danbury every week for the last year. And they said the list transfers over. They said, we're sorry, you're not on the list. And I said, well, uh, we don't see a Lawrence Smith. That's my, my ID, my license. And I said, what about Larry Smith? Oh, yeah, he's here. <laughs> that's, that we can't help you. <laughs> And at this point, this is not surprising news that they cannot help you. And I said, well, it's like a nickname? And they said, well, that doesn't, you know. I said, listen, can you call Danbury? And by the way, so there's a three-hour window to visit Piper at the, the Chicago prison. And I'm watching the clock go. And I said, well, can you call Danbury? They can, like, know me there. And I'm totally vouch that I am who I am. And so finally someone gets on the phone, and they call. And, Time passes. Well, no one's there. You know, time passes. Two hours have passed. Uh, there's an hour left. And finally, with about 25 or 30 minutes left, they said, okay, it's cool. You can go in. So we spent a little time together. Now, fortunately, most of the time when Piper was in prison was, in fact, spent at the Danbury Women's Correctional Institution, which is no picnic. <laughs> but it was looking pretty good. And at the Danbury, well, in prison, you know, there's sort of a, things don't necessarily make a lot of sense. They're either, and there's sort of a refrain that prisoners use, you had nothing coming. And what that means is, hey, how come the GED program has been canceled? Why isn't the track open? Prisoner, don't ask questions, you got nothing coming. And that kind of extended to the loved ones in their lives, the people who visited them and, and cared for them every week. And, uh, you you know you sort of you sort of got used to that, but uh, but it was still it was still pretty humiliating, and but eventually I uh, I did sort of get the the rhymes and reasons you know of the prison, so um, uh, I learned that you were allowed one kiss upon greeting uh, your lady or whoever, and one kiss upon leaving. Uh, so, and I got kind of, you know, I kind of got into a groove, you know, after a while and had to do things like you don't wear shorts. My friend came four hours, train and then a cab, 
and he showed up in shorts. Sorry, no shorts. Out. You know, you got nothing coming. And so what was happening, though, while Piper was in prison, is it could go a couple of ways in terms of, of being there. You can uh, get totally awesome shape and read tons of books, where you can like eat all the crappy food and watch bad TV. And that's a sort of binary, and it's broadly speaking, but it is kind of the truth, you know? And Piper chose the former. And so what was happening was, she was getting more and more ripped. <laughs> and I was getting more and more backed up. <laughs> and also, she made friends with a prison seamstress who turned her baggy brown khakis into tight, tight, tight. And it was getting really tough for me in there. <laughs> And our kisses, beginning and end, were, I kind of was pushing it a little bit, and they were getting a little bit longer, and they were lingering a little bit. And at some point, a guard, the most hated guard, a guard that Piper nicknamed Gay Porn Star, <laughs> saw us kissing, and he yelled, Watch the contact, or you're out of here! And every head turned at us in that visiting room. And I was humiliated. The Piper was humiliated, but she was also scared. Because you can go to the shoe, solitary, for illegal contact, and that is no place you want to be. And that humiliation was really part of, certainly for prisoners who were groped and harassed, and just, you know, that was part of their daily life. But for us visiting the ones we loved, it was, it was kind of new. And it didn't matter, stockbroker, pipe fitter, whatever, journalist, you just, you know, you had to all kind of eat shit. Because you know when you go into the DMV and you think that, like, if you're sort of nice to the receptionist, and, like, somehow you're like, somehow in less than 10 hours, and you finish and you start working, you have that same fall out of at the prison guard. Like, no, you do like it doesn't come quicker, and your, your, your fiance is not coming out of that room quicker, and if that guard's in a bad mood, she just won't even call to tell me you're there for 30 minutes. You got nothing coming. And so, but I just, it was hard, I think, also for guys to have that false humility. We're just not good at it. But we ate shit and we sucked it up. Um, but the truth is, they weren't all the gay porn star. They're all, who, by the way, he was called gay porn star because he sort of looked like that Tom of Finland cartoon, you know? <laughs> he just looked like a gay porn star. He was not a nice man. But they all weren't like that. And in fact, there was, there was a woman who, I, who was pretty agreeable. She was a, a guard in the visiting room a lot. And, um, and I sort of got to know her a little bit after a year. You do, you talk, you know? And I learned that she was, before prison guard, she was an exterminator in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and as the seasons changed, the point where the light from the windows would come in would sort of move around the room. And at some point for like a while, they were right on the desk. So she started wearing these like mirrored glasses, but like she just walked off the set of like Terminator 6. You know? <laughs> and it was so weird. But I, I, my job, really, while Piper was in prison, was to try to take care of her, you know? And as a Jew, um, how we take care of her, and lots of people, is, is food, you know? Like, you throw food at the problem. <laughs> I've been throwing food at the problem called Piper for years. When I was courting her, kind of, like, we were friends, but then sort of maybe it was changing, and I was like, hmm. Lesbian, but still. And, uh, we both knew that we were in trouble when I came back from a visit home to my folks in Philly and I brought back with me a soft pretzel when I mentioned it over to her office. <laughs> that was sort of the moment we both knew we were in trouble. And so I was throwing food at the problem. The night before she went to prison, you know, sort of what do you do exactly? So you, know, you cook like a kick ass meal, right? And I'm not like a wizard in the kitchen. So you go with what you know, and I got like big steaks, and uh, and I made my famous, I cut the potatoes real thin and fry them, and I got foie gras, which would later upset the duck people, but nonetheless, <laughs> it was easy and delicious, and a great bottle of wine. And you watch The Big Lebowski, and you, you go to bed, and you cry, and you wake up, and you take, you take your fiance to prison. And when you're in the prison, uh, you also, you know, I still, I still want to sort of care for her and feed her. And uh, let me, just the visiting room, it's, it's weird. It's kind of like a, like a depressing kindergarten classroom. 
<laughs> these little, these little kind of card tables, kind of shitty card tables and folding chairs. And there was this kind of makeshift chapel in the corner with a sign that says, smile, God loves you. And every 14-year-old instinct in you wanted to make it, dog loves you. <laughs> but you, you didn't, you know? And, and so what there was perhaps one of the bright spots was the vending machine. Now, bright spot is a stretch, um, but it had food in it. And this vending machine had that, that automat feel where it's circular and there's food on plates, but not like cool throwback thing, but like kind of full, like you wouldn't really want it even if you were in an airport. And the food that showed up in the, in the vending machine was a lot like prison, random and unpredictable, you know? So there'd be like a yogurt in there one week and some sandwiches of indistinguishable like note. And maybe like, I think I saw a Yuhu once. <laughs> but we kinda we kinda mainly had microwave popcorn, Diet Coke and Fritos. You know? And also like prisoners can't touch money. So every week when I would talk to her, you get this this is a call from federal prison, press one, yes, you know, take it. Don't forget the quarters. I'm not going to forget the quarters. You know? And then I get her the food and and these were really special hours, actually. These three hours a week, more or less, we spent together because we didn't do kind of talk about the, the kind of the stuff that we talked about then and frankly now, which is like real estate in Brooklyn and the new hot restaurant from New York Magazine, the <laughs> Atlantic article about how women really cannot have it all. You know? <laughs> we just, it was us, and there's no phones allowed in the visit. Just us for three hours, and I do the Six Word Memoir Project, and the Six Word Memoir T-shirt I wrote when we did a book on love was our prison visitations were surprise and romantic, which is a T-shirt tonight. And those three hours were really, were really kind of special for us because it was like just us, and it was quiet. And admittedly, her life didn't change that much day to day, and mine did, but it was really truly special time. And and something a lot of people really don't know about Piper is that she's kind of she's kind of a loner. Um, she is kind of introverted, which is funny for a woman who wrote a memoir that became a TV series. <laughs> but in fact, she is, and as, as loud and extroverted as I am, she's she's sort of a quiet person. And she's happy to sit home and read a book. And I'm always like organizing things. All right, everybody to Governor's Island, and then we're all going to go to Queens. And it's going to be awesome. And this other guy, let me text somebody. And that's what I do, and I love it. And that's not what she does. And I found myself while she was in prison, sort of doing it again. I'm like, okay, so I didn't want. I wanted. To, I was like the social director because I didn't want. To, I didn't want four people to show up on one weekend to visit, and then none the next weekend. And those friends. I mean, she often talks about how the friends she made in prison really helped her get through it, and the friends outside of prison helped both her and me get through it. And, you know, these are friends who said, like, dude, we're all going to Mexico, and you and Piper should go, but Piper can't, because uh, she committed an uh, international drug uh, uh, trafficking conspiracy, and you didn't, so we're all done. Margaritas and quesadillas feel, like, terrible. I'm like, dude, seriously, come on, we got a house, it's awesome. So, you know, I went. In a way, I feel better knowing that like people were coming to visit her. People were coming by train, and they were coming by car, and sometimes town car, and, and even by plane. And our friend, our good friend Jeff Kramer, had moved to San Francisco, and and he flew in to see her. And Jeff is a man who has a passion for food unlike anyone I know, and he could be at a deep Queens Thai restaurant. This is like whitest guy you've ever met. And he'll speak fluent Thai to the waiter and order the best four dishes on the menu and, and the, yeah, the waiter will give him the nod, you know? And he's also very happy eating like a dog and a beer at a Giants game in San Francisco. And Jeff got to that visiting room and he saw the vending machine. And then he did something that Piper can attest to was one of the most amazing and appalling thing, things she saw during her 13 months at the Danbury Federal Prison. He bought the frozen chicken wings. <laughs> he put in 16 quarters and bought the frozen chicken wings. <laughs> so, on March 4th, 2005, exactly 13 months after I dropped Piper off in Danbury, 
I went back to Chicago to pick her up. She really wanted to leave from Danbury for closure and to see her friends and have this sort of goodbye party that the women had for each other. But her time was up and they literally had to let her go from Chicago. And the, her lawyer said, if you wait for Con Air, there is Con Air, by the way, Con Air to pick you up, it could be three or four weeks. You gotta go. And we had fights about that. I don't, you need, you gotta go. So she agreed. So when I got her, we flew back from O'Hare to Newark. And we, I said, by the way, we moved to Brooklyn. <laughs> and, and tonight, honey, you can eat anywhere you want. Do you want to go to Bobo or Blue Ribbon? Or what do you want to do? She said, I want to get a slice of pizza. And I want to go home. And that's what we did, and it was good. Aww.